Lecture 16. God, the argument from cause. We've been talking about arguments for God's existence. Last time, we talked about the ontological argument, an argument that tries to prove that a perfect being exists by definition. We saw that it failed pretty dramatically. Today, we're going to talk about the cosmological argument, the argument from cause. We will see that, although it does not point specifically to a perfect being, if successful, it will point to some kind of divine being. But in exploring this argument, we are also going to get at a more fundamental metaphysical question about the universe. Why is there something rather than nothing? And so think of our exploration of the cosmological argument not only as a foray into whether or not God exists, but also into why the universe exists. There are multiple versions of the cosmological argument. We will start with the simplest one. It goes like this. Every event has a cause, but every cause is itself an event, which means that it must have a cause. But that must have a cause, and that too, and so there seems to be a causal chain, a progression of causes and effects reaching back into the past. But that causal chain can't be infinite. It cannot just keep going back forever. It must end in something, and whatever it ends in must itself be a cause, but must not be caused by anything else. It must be an uncaused causer that sits at the end of the causal chain. And that uncaused causer must be God. Easy enough, right? But there are multiple problems with this argument. First of all, it seems to jump to the God conclusion far too quickly. Even if there is a first cause, nothing in this argument tells us anything about the nature of that cause. That it's all-powerful, that it's all-knowing, that it's all-good, or even that it's a being or a person. You would need a separate argument for that, and although I've heard a few proposed, I've never known philosophers to be very convinced by them. But perhaps the argument establishes that there is a first uncaused cause. Might that at least need to be some kind of deity? Unfortunately not. First of all, we know the universe originated from a singularity, an infinitely small point that existed for no time and is governed by no known laws, from which the Big Bang was generated. Now, the story of how we know that the Big Bang occurred is actually quite interesting. The idea that the universe is expanding, and in fact, space-time itself is expanding, entailed that it is all expanding away from a single point, a point in which all matter in the universe was first contained and then exploded. This type of Big Bang would have left a signature microwave background radiation throughout the entire universe. And the discovery of such a radiation, which really could be caused by nothing else, would be high confirmation for this theory. And this is, in fact, exactly what we found. Although, quite ironically, we found it by accident. Scientists Arno Penzias and Robert Wilson were doing experiments with radio waves and a super-sensitive horn antenna. To get a reliable reading, they had to clear all interference, eliminate all signals the antenna was receiving. They were able to do so except for a low, mysterious hum that was everywhere in all directions at all times. No matter when and where they pointed the horn antenna, the hum was there. They checked everything. They even thought it might be the result of pigeon droppings on the antenna, and so they cleaned them off and scared away the pigeons, and yet the hum remained. They determined that it wasn't coming from the Earth, the Sun, or even our galaxy. A friend put them in contact with a group who was about to look for evidence of the Big Bang by detecting the radiation left over from it. And then everyone realized that Penzias and Wilson had beat them to the punch. The interference they couldn't get rid of was actually microwave noise left over from the Big Bang. And if the universe is expanding as a result of the Big Bang, then all matter in the universe was once contained in a single point, a singularity. So, we already have a candidate for a first cause, the singularity from which the universe emerged. And if anything is a candidate for something that is uncaused, it would seem to be the singularity. First of all, since the Big Bang marks the beginning of time, nothing can come before the singularity. Yet, causes precede their effects, so it seems that the singularity cannot have a cause because nothing can come before it. 
In addition, the singularity is about as simple as you can get. It is as small as you can get, it exists for no time, and is governed by no laws. Whatever else you introduced as a cause for the singularity would seem to demand a cause even more than the singularity itself, especially if you introduced a deity that has a wide range of infinite properties like omnipotence. And so, at least initially, if there must be an uncaused causer, it seems that the singularity is the most likely candidate. The only thing that would seem to demand a cause less than the singularity would be nothingness. But, ironically enough, nothingness may actually be the explanation for the singularity. Let me elaborate. First of all, because of quantum mechanics, we know that there are uncaused events. We've already talked about a few of them, like the decay of a uranium atom, and we will talk about more later. Like Professor Hubert J. Farnsworth once said on Futurama, quantum physics means that anything can happen at any time for no reason. So we actually know the first premise of this argument, that every event has a cause, is false. But more importantly, it is common knowledge in quantum mechanics that the creation of matter can be uncaused. It can literally spring from nothing. In a vacuum, it is possible, and actually quite common, for subatomic particle-antiparticle pairs to spontaneously come into existence and then annihilate themselves. This is not a hypothesis. Such events have been measured and confirmed numerous times. They are called quantum vacuum fluctuations. So, we might say this means that, despite the cliché, something really can come from nothing. But, instead of denying that cliché, what some scientists have hypothesized is that even a vacuum is not truly empty. It contains no physical particles, sure, but it does contain the potential for particles, sometimes called virtual particles, a kind of probability field that can collapse into physical particles. Some call this the quantum foam, or the background space. Some physicists, such as Ed Tryon, have pointed out that this is a possible explanation for the origin of the physical universe. Even if the universe didn't exist, there would still be the quantum foam, and a fluctuation in the quantum foam could produce a universe such as ours. And although particles that come into existence within an already existing universe due to quantum fluctuations do not last long, an entire universe that came into being due to a fluctuation in the quantum foam could last a very long time. Of course, you might be wondering what causes the quantum foam, but remember, for all intents and purposes, it's nothing. It's just a mathematical probability field. It doesn't need a cause. Certainly, any cause you interjected to explain it would demand a causal explanation even more than the quantum foam does. So, even if there is an uncaused causer, it need not necessarily be a deity of any kind. The singularity would be a much better candidate for an uncaused causer, since it is nearly propertyless, and a fluctuation in the quantum foam might be even better. Such a thing may be responsible for the singularity. But there may not even need to be an uncaused causer, because there may not even need to be a first event. Perhaps the causal chain actually is infinite. Some have suggested that this is impossible because nothing in the universe is actually infinite, not even the universe itself. Only non-existent hypothetical entities like number lines can be infinite. But this suggestion is problematic. First of all, a theist can't embrace this line of reasoning because they believe that God is infinite, and certainly they believe that God exists. Secondly, the assumption is wrong. Black holes exist, and they have infinite volume. We'll, we'll talk more about black holes later. Besides, I'm not sure we even really understand infinity well enough to be declaring whether or not it's impossible. For example, did you know that there are greater orders of infinity? Larger sizes of infinity? A mathematician named Georg Cantor deductively proved this. The amount of counting numbers is called countably infinite, but it's mathematically provable that there are more irrational numbers, decimal numbers that go on forever and never repeat. Their size is called uncountable. In fact, it's even been proven that there is a countably infinite number of greater magnitudes of infinity. And if you want an infinite concept that really blows your mind, look up the mathematical concept of a proper class. I don't have time to explain it all here, it would take an entire lecture at least. My point is that I doubt those giving the cosmological argument 
understand infinity enough to be able to declare that infinite series are impossible. The final problem with the first cosmological argument is that it seems to refute itself. It stipulates that every event has a cause, but every cause is an event. It follows from this, necessarily, that anything that is a cause must be caused. But then it concludes that there is a cause which is not caused, an uncaused causer. You can't say that every cause has a cause, but then say there is a cause that doesn't have a cause. You can't have it both ways. The conclusion of the argument is refuted by its first two premises. Recognizing the shortcomings of this argument, some have revamped and revised it into an argument regarding explanation. The primary premise of this argument is called the principle of sufficient reason. It suggests that everything needs an explanation. So, everything either has an explanation outside of itself, or it is its own explanation. Philosophers call something that is explained by something else a dependent entity. It is dependent upon something else for its existence. But, the argument assumes, it can't be that everything is dependent, it can't be that everything is explained by something else. Again, this would seem to generate an infinite chain where each thing is dependent upon the next. Proponents of the argument suggest that this is impossible because the existence of that chain would violate the principle of sufficient reason. The chain itself would need an explanation. And so the argument concludes, something must be non-dependent. Something must be its own explanation, and that would be God. There are numerous objections to this argument as well. First of all, the principle of sufficient reason is problematic. It seems to ignore the possibility of brute facts, things that are true for no reason. The principle amounts to saying that the truth value of every proposition must have an explanation for why it has the truth value it has. But it's not clear that this is the case. First of all, what is the explanation for the principle of sufficient reason being true? If it is true, it would seem to be true for no reason. It would just be true, a brute fact. But if so, then it would be a counterexample to itself, an example of something that is true without an explanation. Second of all, what makes propositions like 1 plus 1 equals 2 true? It would seem that offering up an explanation for why this is true would be a fool's errand. Now that's not to say that some people haven't tried, and I wouldn't call Bertrand Russell and Alfred North Whitehead fools, even though Kurt Gödel proved theirs was an impossible task, but some propositions may simply be true, and the proposition, the universe exists, would be one of them. Secondly, contrary to what the argument assumes, an infinite chain of dependent beings, each dependent on the next, may not violate the principle of sufficient reason. It states that everything needs an explanation. But if all that exists is an infinite chain of dependent beings, each explained by the last thing in the chain, then everything does have an explanation, the thing before it. The argument demands that the chain itself needs an explanation, but it's unclear why you must view the chain itself as an extra thing that needs an explanation. Recall our discussion when we talked about whether persons exist regarding what objects we should include in our ontology, our list of things that exist. In most cases, whether or not to count some collection of objects as a separately existing entity is just a matter of convention. It's not like we are forced by some ontological rule to conclude that an infinite chain of dependent beings is itself a separately existing object that must have an explanation. And even if you are, why can't the chain itself be the self-explanatory entity? After all, I'm not even sure the concept of self-explanation is coherent. The only example I can think of would be a series where each part of the series explains another part of the series, like an infinite explanatory chain or a, or a circular one. If that's not a self-explanatory entity, I don't know what is. So it doesn't seem to follow at all that the chain itself would require an additional explanation. Lastly, like the argument before it, this argument seems to jump to the God conclusion. Even if there is a self-explained thing, nothing in this argument entails that thing must be all-powerful, all-knowing, all-good, etc. That would require a separate argument, and none are regarded as persuasive. But for argument's sake, let's grant that there must be a self-explained entity. What would that entity be like? Would it have to be a deity of some kind? 
Again, it seems not. The self-explained entity could be the universe itself, or more specifically, the singularity from which the universe came about, or the quantum foam in which that singularity appeared. It could be any of those things as easily as it could be anything else. In fact, anything that you would hypothesize as an explanation for such things would seem to cry out for an explanation even more than what you were explaining. As we discussed earlier, the singularity is the simplest possible entity, except for the quantum foam, which is, in every meaningful way, nothingness, only a probability field. Any further explanation offered will be more complex and thus raise the need for an additional explanation, especially if that thing has properties like omnipotence. In addition, introducing an additional explanation for the universe, when it could be that the universe is self-explained, violates a fundamental rational principle, Occam's razor. All things being equal, we should prefer the hypothesis that is the simplest. That is, the hypothesis that has the fewest number of assumptions, that has the least amount of stuff in it. If you already know that something exists, then of course it's fine to hold that that thing exists. But if you can avoid being committed to extra things that you don't know exist, that is preferable. So, if it is possible to maintain that it is the universe itself that is self-explained, thus avoiding the need to introduce anything else to explain it, then that is the preferable hypothesis. In short, the hypothesis that the universe exists and is self-explained is simpler than the hypothesis both the universe and God exist, and God explains the universe, but God himself is self-explained. The first hypothesis is simpler. It has fewer assumptions. It has the least amount of stuff in it. But another argument has been proposed to answer this last criticism. Some theists maintain that the universe can't be its own explanation, but God can. And so it is preferable to introduce God as a self-explained entity to thus explain the universe, which does, they say, demand an explanation. Why does the universe demand an outside explanation, but God does not? Because, the argument suggests, everything that begins to exist must have an outside explanation. Think about all the objects that you have come across in your lifetime. All of them began to exist, and all of them have an explanation. The universe is like this too. It began to exist. But God, if he exists, did not. He has always been. So he doesn't need an outside explanation. So, since the universe began to exist, but God did not, the universe needs an explanation, but God doesn't. And, it seems, God is the best candidate for the explanation that the universe apparently needs. This argument is called the Kalam cosmological argument. Again, there are numerous objections to this argument, some of which are simple and some of which are pretty complex. Let's deal with the complex one first. The first objection observes that the argument seems to beg the question, to assume the truth of what it tries to prove. To understand why, let me again remind you of the ontological debate we discussed when we discuss the nature of persons and the hypothesis that persons don't exist. Recall this thought experiment. Suppose you know the number of objects in the universe is X, and you have a piece of paper in your hand. You tear that piece of paper in half. Now how many objects are there in the universe? Is it X plus 1? Perhaps, but does that mean that you have added to the substance of the universe? Have you created new matter? No. All you have done is arrange the existing matter of the universe in a different way than it was arranged before. I guess you can call a new arrangement of matter a new object if you wish. Recall, some philosophers conclude that it's wrong to call them objects at all. But if nothing else, what the thought experiment teaches us is that the quote-unquote things we call objects on a daily basis are just rearrangements of existing matter. Why is this important? Well, recall how the Kalam cosmological argument built up your intuition that everything needs an explanation. It did so by using examples of things from your everyday life that began to exist and need an explanation. But any given object that is being explained is just an arrangement of the matter of the universe. 
What is being explained is how that matter got to be in the arrangement it did. It is when that matter was arranged as such that the object came into existence. And so the first premise of the argument, if it's going to have any evidence behind it at all, must simply be this. Every arrangement of matter that we call an object must have an explanation for how its matter came to be arranged as it did. But that tells us nothing at all about whether the existence of the matter that is being arranged needs an explanation. But since that is what the conclusion of the argument is suggesting when it suggests that the universe needs an explanation, recall, it's suggesting that the matter that makes up the entire universe needs an explanation for its existence, that is what the first premise of the argument would have to say if the argument is going to be valid. But now the problem is, if that's the argument's first premise, the argument just begs the question. The matter that makes up everyday objects is the matter of the universe. So to demand that the matter that makes them up needs an explanation is the same thing as demanding that the universe needs an explanation. So in short, the Kalam cosmological argument begins with the premise, the matter of the universe needs an explanation and ends with the conclusion, the matter of the universe needs an explanation. Clearly, this argument gets us nowhere. It begs the question. It assumes the truth of what it's trying to prove. The other objections to this argument are not as complex, which is ironic because they involve quantum mechanics. First of all, the premise of the argument that would suggest that everything that comes into existence needs an explanation is simply false. As we discussed earlier, it is a known phenomenon in quantum mechanics that, in a vacuum, particles can come into existence for no reason and with no explanation. And, although such particles quickly annihilate themselves because they are coming into existence in an already existing universe, we know that it is possible for the universe to have come into existence in exactly the same way, as a result of a fluctuation in the quantum foam. In addition, even if it's true that everything that begins to exist needs an explanation, the quantum foam from which the universe sprang would be eternal. It exists everywhere matter is not. So even if the universe doesn't exist, the quantum foam does. It's always there. And so, by the lights of the Kalam cosmological argument itself, it would not need an explanation. So now that we have considered these arguments, let us return to the fundamental question. Why is there something rather than nothing? Why is the proposition, there is something, true? If we think that everything needs an explanation, then we may simply say that this fact explains itself, or is explained by fluctuations in the quantum foam, and the quantum foam explains itself. But ultimately, it's likely better to just appeal to brute facts. Propositions that are true, that have no explanation. They're just true. Perhaps the fact that there is something is just a brute fact, or perhaps the existence of the quantum foam is just a brute fact. Now, you may not find this intellectually satisfying, but there are a couple of things to keep in mind. First of all, remember how intellectually satisfied you were about scientific explanations. Recall that scientific explanations must bottom out in brute facts. We have no explanations for why the fundamental constants of physics have the values they do. Why does the charge to mass ratio of the electron have the value it does? Why is the speed of light what it is? It seems that these facts just are true. And even if we do one day explain them with something else, that new fact will be a brute fact. And so, brute facts are not uncommon and seem to be unavoidable. But if you don't find brute facts intellectually satisfying, keep in mind that invoking unknown inexplicable entities as explanations is even more intellectually unsatisfying. Recall the collapsed bridge example, where an expert is trying to figure out what made a bridge collapse. Someone comes in and tells him that he knows what did it. An inexplicable being with an inexplicable force made the bridge collapse. But when pressed for more information, where the being came from, what was the force like, why did the being do it, the person just shrugs his shoulders and says, I don't know, it's inexplicable. This does not help. This is not an explanation. Certainly, it is not an intellectually satisfying one. And so, if you find the hypothesis that the existence of the universe is a brute fact intellectually unsatisfying, that's understandable. 
but you cannot invoke an unexplained entity with unexplained powers as a way to solve that problem, as a way to curb your intellectual hunger or quench your metaphysical thirst for understanding. Just like in the bridge example, that just raises more questions than it answers. Where does the being come from? How do its powers work? Why did the being do it? All of these questions are left unanswered. It's like when you see a magic trick that you can't explain. How did they do it? The rational thing to conclude is they did it by some natural means that you could not detect. That there is an explanation, you simply can't figure it out. But if your explanation is, hey, they have magical powers, not only is that silly, but it's intellectually unsatisfying. You have no idea how those powers work, and so that's not really an explanation at all. You can't explain the unexplained with the inexplicable. To say it's magic is really just an excuse for not having an explanation, or another way of saying that you don't. The same thing is true for invoking any kind of deity to explain the universe. Even if we don't have an explanation, invoking an unexplained, incomprehensible being as the explanation actually explains nothing. So, the mere existence of the universe does not give us evidence for God's existence. But, perhaps its structure does. Clearly, the structure of parts of the universe, such as our bodies, seem to exhibit design. Perhaps there must be a designer, and that designer is God. The Earth seems to be specifically designed to support life. Might it require a designer? Perhaps most impressively, the universe itself, the laws that govern it, seem to be fine-tuned to make the evolution of life possible. Does that point to a designer? It is to this topic that we will return next lecture.